Welcome. In this second session on secondary glaucomas with multiple mechanisms, we will be discussing about glaucomas following trauma and intraocular surgery. And we have discussed some of these mechanisms in earlier sessions, which we will be mentioning as we proceed. Blunt trauma can cause rise in intraocular pressure by multiple mechanisms. Open angle mechanisms which can elevate intraocular pressure early following blunt trauma include contusion of the trabecular meshwork, trabecular disruption, high femur, inflammation and chemical injury. And open angle mechanisms which can elevate intraocular pressure later on following blunt trauma include angle recession, coast cell and hemolytic glaucoma, Schwartz syndrome and delayed closure of cyclodialysis cleft. These two entities we have discussed in a previous session. And angle closure mechanisms which can elevate intraocular pressure following blunt trauma include pupillary block from lens subluxation which we have discussed in a previous session, choroidal hemorrhage and peripheral anterior synechia which can occur as a sequela of a large number of traumatic pathologies. Penetrating injuries can raise intraocular pressure by various mechanisms. Early on, Inflammation, high femur and disruption of crystalline lens can cause rise in intraocular pressure following wound closure. And later on, IOP elevation can result from posterior and peripheral anterior synechia, epithelial and fibrous ingrowths and retained intraocular foreign body. Disruption of crystalline lens or lens particle glaucoma and epithelial and fibrous ingrowths we have discussed in previous sessions. Certain risk factors have been identified which increases the chances of developing glaucoma following trauma and they include advancing age, poor baseline visual acuity, lens and or iris injury, high femur and angle recession more than 180 degrees. Immediately following ocular trauma, intraocular pressure can actually be low due to ciliary body contusion reducing aqueous humor production, cyclodialysis cleft which is a detachment of the ciliary body from the scleral spur as shown here in this diagram which results in increased outflow of aqueous humor from the eye or leakage of aqueous through a penetrating wound. Even eyes which are initially hypotonic following trauma because of these reasons can later develop elevation of intraocular pressure and glaucoma. Contusion of trabecular meshwork following trauma refers to reduced aqueous humor outflow because of trabeculitis. In these patients, we may find a mild anterior chamber reaction, but no other abnormalities are detected on slit lamp or gonioscopy. It is a transient entity and can be treated with anti-inflammatory agents. Trabecular disruption refers to a tearing injury to the trabecular meshwork as evidenced by blood in the trabecular meshwork and Schlem's canal and a torn trabecular meshwork flap which is usually detached from the Schwalbe's line but remain hinged at the scleral spur. These signs of blood in the trabecular meshwork and the torn trabecular meshwork flap can be detected early after injury but after scarring occurs these signs may not be recognized. And in these cases early on there may not be any elevation of intraocular pressure which however occurs later when scarring of the trabecular meshwork follows. Traumatic high femur occurs following rupture of small branches of the major arterial circle which is present in the ciliary body face and the root of the iris following a tear in the iris or the ciliary body and it is more common in young males who are prone to ocular injury and blood in the anterior chamber can appear as floating red blood cells which is called microscopic high femur or layering of the red blood cells can occur in the inferior portion of the anterior segment as shown here in this photograph and this can be either a small high femur or total high femur involving the entire anterior chamber. So in this photograph we find a high femur involving almost half of the anterior chamber and when the high femur has a dark red color which is called a black ball or an eight ball high femur and occurs due to impaired aqueous circulation and impaired oxygenation, the risk of pupillary block and elevated intraocular pressure is even higher. Traumatic high femur raises intraocular pressure by obstruction of the trabecular meshwork by red blood cells 
inflammatory cells and debris. Although intact red blood cells pass through the trabecular mesh work easily, the overwhelming number of red blood cells block the trabecular mesh work. In addition, there can be direct traumatic damage of the trabecular meshwork and a large clot in the anterior chamber may cause a pupillary block. Risk of IOP elevation following traumatic high femur increases further with rebleeding, and this is very very important to remember. Rebleeding occurs in 5 to 10 percent of traumatic high femur patients typically within 3 to 7 days of the initial high femur and intraocular pressure elevation following rebleeding is usually more severe and more frequently required surgical intervention. Prolonged elevation of intraocular pressure in a patient with traumatic high femur may also cause corneal blood staining as shown here in this photograph. Treatment of traumatic high femur includes head elevation in supine position to promote inferior settling of the blood in the anterior chamber, application of eye shield and limitation of physical activity so as to reduce the rate of rebleeding. Steroids and cycloplegics are administered for associated inflammation but they do not reduce incidence of rebleeding. Lowering of intraocular pressure can be achieved with aqueous suppressants and hyperosmotic agents but myotics and prostaglandin analogues which are pro-inflammatory should be avoided and oral NSAIDs should be avoided till high femur has cleared completely because NSAIDs can promote rebleeding. Oral aminocaproic acid and tranexamic acid has been shown in some studies to reduce the rate of rebleeding, but they have significant side effects and risk of rebleeding can increase following discontinuation of these drugs. And administration of these drugs have been found to have no effect on final visual acuity, so they are not used routinely in traumatic high femur except in high risk situations such as sickle cell hemoglobinopathies which we will be discussing next. Surgery for traumatic high femur is indicated when intraocular pressure remains uncontrolled and when there is corneal blood staining. It is also required in young patients to prevent amblyopia from corneal blood staining and from the high femur itself. And there is a very well known guideline for when surgical removal of the blood from the anterior chamber is required based on the intraocular pressure level and the number of days for which the intraocular pressure remains at that level. And surgery is required earlier when the eye with traumatic high femur is known to have a pre-existing glaucomatous optic neuropathy. Most commonly an anterior chamber irrigation is done to wash out the liquid blood. And if there is a pupillary block because of a blood clot, an additional aldotomy can also be performed intraoperatively. Usually removal of clot is not required unless the pupil block cannot be relieved and removal of clot can be done ideally on or after 4 days when the clot starts to retract with vitrectomy instrumentation. Filtering surgery will be required if anterior chamber irrigation is not effective in controlling the intraocular pressure. Injection of tissue plasminogen activated to dissolve clot in the anterior chamber has also been described but it is associated with an increased risk of rebleeding. Patients with sickle cell hemoglobinopathies, either disease or trait, having a traumatic high femur is a special situation. Traumatic high femur has a worse prognosis in patients with sickle cell hemoglobinopathies both because of a higher incidence of raised intraocular pressure in these patients and also because of the risk of vaso-occlusive events in the posterior segment in these patients with elevated intraocular pressure. The red blood cells in the anterior chamber tend to sickle because of the low pH of the environment in the anterior chamber and in contrast to normal RBCs, these sickled RBCs in the anterior chamber can cause more severe obstruction of the trabecular meshwork. And following elevation of intraocular pressure, red blood cells in the vascular supply of the posterior segment can sickle and can cause anterior ischemic optic neuropathy and central retinal arterial occlusions. So traumatic high femur in sickle cell hemoglobinopathies require aggressive treatment and intraocular pressure needs to be lowered even if elevation of the intraocular pressure is mild.
but systemic carbonic anhydrase inhibitors which can lower pH further and can cause dehydration and hyperosmotic agents which can cause dehydration can promote sickling and should be avoided. Non-selective alpha adrenergic agonists such as aplaclonidine should be avoided as they may induce sickling because of vasoconstriction and high femur drainage from anterior chamber has a much lower threshold in patients with sickle cell hemoglobinopathies and is indicated if intraocular pressure is more than 25 mm of mercury for more than 24 hours following trauma. Choroidal hemorrhage from trauma can cause intraocular pressure elevation by a posterior pushing mechanism and on examination will find shallowing of both the central and the peripheral portions of the anterior chamber, a loss of red reflex and reddish brown choroidal detachments on ophthalmoscopy. Treatment of choroidal hemorrhage is initially conservative with systemic steroids and ocular hypotensives. But surgical drainage of the choroidal hemorrhage will be required when there is cornea lens touch, kissing choroidals or persistently raised intraocular pressure. This photograph shows the phenomena of kissing choroidals when the two bullas of choroidal detachment touch, resulting in contact between the two layers of retina over the bullas. And surgical drainage of choroidal hemorrhage should be done several days after the trauma ideally 10 to 14 days to allow the blood in the suprachoroidal space to liquefy and choroidal hemorrhage is drained by a full thickness scleral incision at the site of maximum accumulation of suprachoroidal blood and draining the suprachoroidal blood externally through this full thickness scleral incision. Following chemical injury, particularly alkali injury, there can be acute elevation of intraocular pressure due to shrinkage of scleral collagen and this is important to remember. Acute elevation of intraocular pressure following chemical injury can also occur due to direct damage to the trabecular meshwork, inflammation and compromised anterior uveal circulation as represented by the limbal ischemia in this photograph and chronic elevation of intraocular pressure following chemical injury occurs due to recurrent inflammation and damage to the trabecular meshwork. Post chemical injury elevation of intraocular pressure should be treated with IOP lowering agents but myotics and prostaglandin analogs should be avoided as they are pro-inflammatory and every attempt should be made to measure intraocular pressure in the acute setting of chemical injury as well as at every visit during follow-up. And in addition to IOP lowering agents, standard treatment of chemical injury also includes steroids, cycloplegics, ascorbic acid and doxycycline which we will be discussing in the section on cornea. In angle recession, there is a traumatic tear in the ciliary body which causes separation between the circular and the longitudinal fibers of the ciliary body muscle. The tear in the ciliary body itself does not cause elevation of intraocular pressure but it acts as a sign of traumatic damage to the adjacent trabecular meshwork which causes IOP elevation. And in eyes with angle recession, histopathological examination has revealed trabecular meshwork scarring and endothelialization of the angle recess from the corneal endothelium and angle recession is quite common following blunt trauma. As we have mentioned, elevation of intraocular pressure following angle recession is due to damage to the adjacent trabecular meshwork and elevation of IOP following angle recession has been found to be bimodal in distribution either occurring in the first year following trauma or after 10 years following trauma. And the more extensive the angle recession, the higher the chances of developing raised intraocular pressure. But it has been seen that only 7 to 9% of eyes with angle recession of more than 180 degrees ultimately develop angle recession glaucoma. So even though angle recession is very common following blunt trauma, only a minor proportion of patients with angle recession ultimately develop angle recession glaucoma. Interestingly, up to 50% of patients with angle recession glaucoma develop primary open angle glaucoma in the other eye. And the explanation put forward for this is that eyes developing glaucoma following angle recession are predisposed to develop primary open angle glaucoma.
and so eyes with angle recession glaucoma following blunt trauma as well as their fellow eyes should be monitored long term. When glaucoma develops following angle recession, the patient is typically asymptomatic as with primary open angle glaucoma. But unlike primary open angle glaucoma, angle recession glaucoma is typically unilateral and usually the patient gives a history of blunt trauma. Although it is possible that the patient has forgotten about that incident which occurred years earlier and thus fails to give such a history. The anterior chamber will appear deeper in the eye with angle recession as compared to the fellow eye and other features of blunt trauma may be present in the anterior and posterior segments of that eye. The characteristic gonioscopic feature of angle recession is widening of the ciliary body band as seen here in this photograph and which is very important to remember and this is usually accompanied with a posterior displacement of the iris root. And to discern this widening of the ciliary body band, comparison with the same angle quadrant of the fellow eye is helpful. In addition to widening of the ciliary body band, gonioscopy in eyes with angle recession can also reveal torn iris processes, a glistening white scleral spur as seen here in this photograph. Peripheral anterior synechia at the margins of the angle recession and irregular and dark pigmentation of the trabecular meshwork. Elevation of IOP following angle recession can be lowered with aqueous suppressants and prostaglandin analogs, but laser trabeculoplasty has reduced effectiveness in angle recession glaucoma. Filtering surgery may be required when medications fail to control the intraocular pressure, and in these traumatized eyes, Trabeculectomy with antimetabolites is recommended, but traumatic scarring of the conjunctiva may preclude this procedure. If trabeculectomy with antimetabolites is not possible, glaucoma drainage devices are an option in this scenario. As we have mentioned earlier, cyclodialysis is a separation of the ciliary body from the scleral spur, which may occur following blunt trauma and cyclodialysis results in hypotony due to increased egress of aqueous humor through the cleft as well as due to reduced aqueous humor production from the detached ciliary body. The cyclodialysis cleft may close spontaneously causing elevation of intraocular pressure which is often acute, severe and symptomatic resembling angle closure glaucoma but with an open angle on gonioscopy and following closure of the cyclodialysis cleft which elevates the intraocular pressure, a diagnosis of post-traumatic cyclodialysis cleft can be made from the previous records documenting cyclodialysis cleft or by administration of myotics and phenylephrin which may reopen the cleft and lower the elevated intraocular pressure. And with retained intraocular foreign body, which we will be discussing in detail in the section on retina, glaucoma is more common with retained iron containing foreign body as compared with retained copper containing foreign body. Ocular surgery can cause elevation of intraocular pressure by multiple mechanisms. Open angle mechanisms include blockage of trabecular meshwork by OVD, red blood cells, inflammatory cells and pigments, lens particle glaucoma which we have discussed in an earlier session, distortion of trabecular meshwork and elevation of IOP due to steroids administered post-operatively which we have also discussed in the previous session. Angle closure mechanisms which may elevate intraocular pressure following ocular surgery include malignant glaucoma, pseudophagic and aphagic pupillary block glaucoma and shallowing of the anterior chamber from wound leak. These two entities we have discussed in previous sessions. Transient elevation of intraocular pressure can occur following uncomplicated cataract surgery and laser procedures such as capsulotomy, iridotomy and trabeculoplasty. Though transient, it can be detrimental for an eye with existing advanced glaucomatous optic neuropathy. Sustained elevations of intraocular pressure are more common following complicated cataract surgery, vitreoretinal surgery and penetrating keratoplasty. On the other hand, following uncomplicated phacoemulsification, there is usually a long-term lowering of intraocular pressure. And so far as ophthalmic viscosurgical devices are concerned, elevation of intraocular pressure is more with dispersive OVDs as compared to cohesive OVDs, 
This is because complete removal of dispersive OVDs are often difficult. And most studies have shown that there is no significant elevation of intraocular pressure following use of hydroxypropyl methyl cellulose. Shallow or flat anterior chamber occurs following surgery due to a wound leak and this usually occurs following cataract and glaucoma surgery. The leak can be detected by Siddle's test and with a wound leak in the early post-operative period the eye will be found to be hypotonic. But prolonged flat chamber may result in peripheral anterior synechia formation and elevation of intraocular pressure. When a shallow or a flat anterior chamber due to a wound leak is detected in the early post-operative period, a pressure bandage can be applied for 1 to 3 days. And if the anterior chamber does not reform in this period, suturing of the wound will be required. And suturing of the wound will be required earlier if the vitreous or the intraocular lens touches the endothelium or there is corneal edema, significant inflammation or posterior synechia formation. We may note here in contrast to vitreous or intraocular lens touching the endothelium, an iridocorneal touch is relatively well tolerated. Uveitis glaucoma hyphema syndrome or UGH syndrome is an inflammatory glaucoma which occurs following cataract surgery due to chafing or rubbing of the intraocular lens with uveal tissues and this can happen with a malpositioned anterior chamber IOL, an iris or scleral fixated IOL or implantation of a single piece hydrophobic acrylic IOL in the ciliary sulcus and this is very important to remember. UGH syndrome presents with chronic inflammation, recurrent hyphema and signs of pigment dispersion such as iris transillumination defects as seen here in this photograph with the shape of the iris transillumination defect resembling that of the IOL haptic rubbing against the posterior iris surface. Other signs of pigment dispersion include pigment deposition on endothelium and heavy pigmentation of the trabecular meshwork. Elevated intraocular pressure is another common feature of UGH syndrome and eyes with UGH syndrome may develop cystoid macular edema and or iris neovascularization. And the IOL causing UGH syndrome may require removal or exchange. NDA capsulotomy is known to increase intraocular pressure and this occurs because blockage of the trabecular meshwork with capsular and inflammatory debris or because of forward prolapse of the vitreous through the posterior capsulotomy causing pupillary block and administration of brimonidine or oral acetazolamide one hour before or immediately after the procedure can minimize the post laser pressure spikes and this is important to remember retinal laser photocoagulation particularly when extensive can cause swelling and forward rotation of the ciliary body thus causing angle closure by a posterior pushing mechanism which we have discussed in an earlier session. Following penetrating keratoplasty, elevation of intraocular pressure is found commonly and may occur in as many as 30% of eyes undergoing penetrating keratoplasty. And in addition to causing glaucomatous optic neuropathy, this elevation of intraocular pressure may also cause failure of the graft and causes of intraocular pressure elevation following penetrating keratoplasty are numerous and may include distortion of the trabecular meshwork, high femur, inflammation, retained OVDs obstructing the trabecular meshwork, peripheral anterior synechia formation, pupillary block, aqueous misdirection, supracoroidal hemorrhage, long-term therapy with steroids and epithelial ingrowths. Factors which are known to increase the risk of development of glaucoma following penetrating keratoplasty include older age, corneal pathologies for which the penetrating keratoplasty is being done such as congenital corneal opacities, adherent leukoma, herpetic keratitis and bullous keratopathy, pseudophagic or aphagic status of the eye, additional procedures such as anterior segment reconstruction and vitrectomy and repeat penetrating keratoplasty may also increase the risk for developing glaucoma. Certain preventive measures are known to reduce the risk of development of glaucoma 
following penetrating keratoplasty and these include oversizing of the graft with respect to host refination and graft oversizing by 0.5 mm is routinely done. Avoiding excessive tightening of sutures may reduce tissue compression and has been shown to reduce the risk of IOP elevation following penetrating keratoplasty. Beta blockers and alpha-2 adrenergic agonists can be employed to lower elevated intraocular pressure following penetrating keratoplasty, but myotics and prostaglandin analogs should be avoided as they are pro-inflammatory. Carbonic anhydrase inhibitors should also be avoided as they may promote graft failure. Trabeculectomy with antifibrotics or glaucoma drainage devices are often required to control glaucoma following penetrating keratoplasty. And filtering surgery in an eye with a corneal graft is known to induce failure or rejection of the corneal graft and tube of glaucoma drainage devices can be placed in the parts plana or the ciliary sulcus instead of in the anterior segment so as to reduce endothelial cell loss from the corneal graft. Elevation of intraocular pressure following parts plana vitrectomy can be due to several reasons which may include hyphema and inflammation following the surgery, use of vitreous substitutes such as air, gas or silicon oil which may raise intraocular pressure by a posterior pushing mechanism in addition to which droplets of silicon oil has been shown to be able to block the trabecular meshwork. Hemolytic glaucoma, ghost cell glaucoma and neovascular glaucoma are also known to occur following parts planar vitrectomy. Scleral buckling can cause swelling and forward rotation of the ciliary body which can cause shallowing of the anterior chamber by a posterior pushing mechanism. Transient elevation of intraocular pressure can occur following any intravitreal injection including antivagive injections. Sustained elevation of intraocular pressure has been documented following repeated antivagive injections and in these patients reduction in outflow facility has been demonstrated and the risk of sustained intraocular pressure elevation is higher with more frequent injections. To recap the salient points, early elevation of intraocular pressure following blunt trauma can occur due to trabeculitis, high femur, trabecular tear, lens subluxation and choroidal hemorrhage. Later on, IOP elevation following blunt trauma can occur due to angle recession, ghost cell glaucoma, posterior and peripheral anterior synechia formation and delayed closure of a cyclodialysis cleft. Penetrating injuries may cause IOP elevation by additional mechanisms such as lens disruption, prolonged shallowing of the anterior chamber, retained intraocular foreign bodies and epithelial and fibrous ingrowths. Traumatic hyphema is more frequently found in young males. It causes elevation of intraocular pressure by blockage of the trabecular meshwork, pupillary block or associated damage to the trabecular meshwork. Intraocular pressure elevation is more severe with re-bleeding which typically occurs between 3 to 7 days following the initial trauma. Treatment includes eye guard, restriction of activities, head elevation, aqueous suppressants, steroids, cycloplegics, antifibrinolytic agents and avoiding NSAIDs. Surgical treatment by anterior chamber irrigation to remove liquid blood is required when intraocular pressure remains uncontrolled with medical management. High femur in patients with sickle cell hemoglobinopathies cause significant rise in intraocular pressure. The optic nerves are also more prone to damage by raised intraocular pressure in sickle cell hemoglobinopathies. And the threshold for surgically removing blood should be much lower in these patients. Chemical injury, particularly alkali injury, can cause raised intraocular pressure immediately following injury due to shrinkage of collagen fibers of the sclera and cornea. Later on, recurrent inflammation and damage to the trabecular meshwork may lead to persistently elevated intraocular pressure. Angle recession which can occur following blunt trauma is a separation of the radial and circular muscle fibers of the ciliary body. Glaucoma occurs due to associated damage to the adjacent trabecular meshwork. Glaucoma can occur early on or many years later following the trauma. Angle recession appears as a widening of the ciliary body band on gonioscopy.
fellow eyes of angle recession glaucoma have a tendency to develop primary open angle glaucoma. Least intraocular pressure following intraocular surgery can occur due to blockage of the trabecular meshwork with viscoelastics, red blood cells and inflammatory cells, lens particle glaucoma, distortion of the trabecular meshwork, post-operative steroids, malignant glaucoma, aphakic and pseudophakic pupillary block and prolonged shallowing of the anterior chamber due to wound leakage. A flat chamber can be treated conservatively for the initial 1 to 3 days by pressure bandage. If the anterior chamber does not reform by that time, desuturing of the wound will be required. UGH or uveitis glaucoma hyphema syndrome occurs due to shaping of the intraocular lens with the uveal tissues. It usually occurs with anterior chamber intraocular lenses, iris fixated intraocular lenses and single piece hydrophobic eyewells with haptic placement in the sulcus. Signs include chronic inflammation, recurrent hyphema, iris transillumination defect and raised intraocular pressure. Glaucoma following penetrating keratoplasty is common and can occur in as many as 30% of eyes undergoing penetrating keratoplasty. It can occur due to distortion of trabecular meshwork, peripheral anterior synechia, aqueous misdirection, supracoroidal hemorrhage, epithelial ingrowths and prolonged use of steroids. Thank you for listening.